Well, thanks for tuning in to BQ Conversations, a very special conversation with Nilkan Mishra of Credit Suisse to talk about how 2020 is shaping up to be from an investing climate and from a market returns climate as also the economic climate. You can't have a conversation with Nilkan without talking about the economy. Nilkan, so good having you. Thanks so much for speaking to us at Bloomberg Quint. Um, as we move into 2020, uh, just wondering how do you think the positioning on India is, both from, uh, in your mind, how are we positioned, and in the minds of the investors that you as a house might be talking to, how is India positioned? So when we are looking at the, uh, the positioning of investors, we need to keep in mind that there is now increasingly a very large amount of flow coming domestically. So there are domestic institutional investors which have become much larger. As you may have seen, there's been about one and a half lakh crores of funds that have come in in the last 12 months. There is also uh, PMS money. There are the alternative investment funds. Um, I guess your question, though, was uh, more about what the foreign institutional money is, is, is talking about because they, are, they own 40% of free float. They are uh, about two thirds of uh, the trading volumes, and I think the uh, uh, the important thing there is the excitement around India seems to be going away in the sense that India dedicated money, meaning uh, uh, firms or asset allocators aggressively looking to deploy more in India. That instinct is, I think, starting to fade, but we still think that there can be a meaningful amount of inflow into India because. Uh, the, a significant part of the India, the foreign ownership of India, is actually allocations through global funds or EM funds. And uh, the 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 EM fund, the Asia fund allocations, you know, as as firms globally, as 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 savers globally move into equities and then also into emerging market equities, as global uncertainties reduce a bit. I think with the U.S. elections next year, I'm sure. It's going to be still very volatile, but at least the big uncertainties seem to be behind us. There can be some kind of uh, global restocking, some kind of uh, reduction in global uncertainty, and that should mean that foreign flows uh, should also keep happening. And I don't think anyone really wants to stay away from India because there is this dichotomy between fundamentals and expectations in the sense that the weaker the fundamentals are, the stronger the expectations of significant economic reform. So uh, y y if you recall when the corporate tax cut happened, I think a lot of people were taken by surprise. So while people are increasingly worried about the, the, the slowing economic momentum and the negative commentary coming out of corporates, they at the same time do not want to be totally out of India or short India because they fear that it is exactly when their back is to the wall, the, the Indian governments over the past 20, 30 years have undertaken the most structural and positive reform. So, so that hope is still there. So no one really want to, wants to exit India. Coming to domestic investors, I think they, are, well, they need to be in the Indian market. Uh, in terms of expectations, you can see that almost 90% of incremental buying, even by domestic funds, seems to be in, uh, in, in the nifty stocks. Right, so, it's a, so what we are seeing as market strength is actually a very narrow market strength. Um, there are very few stocks which are driving the upside. Uh, one of the things we published in our uh, Outlook note was that uh, even though Nifty and Sensex are at all-time highs, two-thirds of the stocks are more than 20% below their all-time highs in the BSC 500. So, uh, so it's been a narrow rally so far. Uh, we all think that this will continue. So, so long as there is economic uncertainty, I think the, uh, the, the market will remain very narrow, narrow and, and uh, what is being called a quality bubble, I don't think it's really going to deflate. But at the same time, sometime during the year, I think it will reach a point where I think the, the economy will inflect, it has to inflect. And when that happens, we would add on to risk, but I don't think that is, that is this stage. One is what the market investors might be projecting. I just wanted to know what is your projection because as I read your note as well, you do say that the economic slowdown may continue to worsen. What's your projection? And if you believe that inflation may stay high, uh, the the issues that uh, you know come for policy, uh, the constraints that come out on the policy side. Look, um, what we highlight in the report is that uh, a significant part of the decline in GDP growth 
has been driven by industry. So we haven't seen that much of a decline in services growth. We haven't seen uh, a bit of, we have seen a bit of a decline in agriculture, but agriculture, as you know, is only about 15% of GDP, so it doesn't really drive that much of a slowdown. The big decline has been industry falling, industry growth falling from like 8 to 10% to now uh, nearly zero. And in my view, that is driven primarily by a significant amount of destocking. So if, because, you know, if, if, if demand had to fall, then services demand should have fallen as much as well. There can be errors in the, the, the quarterly GDP proxies that are used by CSO, but this is, uh, I, I think, a very large part of the slowdown has been driven by the reduction in inventory. So as that gets over, there should be an automatic stabilizer. So that's the, that's the kind of a positive message that can come out of this. But there, is, there are other fears that uh, we have. There are three pro-cyclical forces which are at play. So as the economic growth slows down, as you see a uh, nominal GDP growth print of 6%, you have, uh, as, as a bank, you need to start re-evaluating your loan books. If there is a loan coming for a rollover, you need to start worrying about whether you should really roll over that loan. We are now starting to hear even uh, you know, some of the more aggressive non-banking finance companies are stopping uh, loan against shares. So, so the banking system, the financial system in aggregate becomes even more cautious. And I think that can drive another leg of the slowdown. The second is the fiscal leg. One of the things we have highlighted in earlier notes and we reiterated in our outlook is that state governments are a very large part of the overall fiscal spending, the government spending. As you know, government spending was a very large part of the first half growth, at least the second quarter growth. And given the tax issues, and the fact that there is no clarity yet on whether state or the central governments, I mean, where the fiscal deficit will land up, there is a fear that there could be a very sharp slowdown in spending. Because of political changes in some of the larger states anyway, the, the contract payments uh, have, have started to slow down. In some cases, they've almost stopped. This has a very negative impact on economic momentum. And the third is sentiment. The first, as I said, was the financial system. Second is fiscal. Third is sentiment for both investment and consumption. So if you were a company, and, and when we talk to, say, a private equity fund, I mean, all the investment committees and boards that they're on top of, they're say, all saying, let's, let's, let's wait six months before we decide on where to invest next. So incrementally, the investment activity starts to slow because of negative sentiment. There is also, from the consumer side, the, the consumer sentiment uh, on current conditions is the worst we've seen this decade. So consumers also start pulling back. And, and all of this means that the, there are significant headwinds to growth. So one hopes that things have stabilized. But given that power demand has gone negative in states like Gujarat, is down almost 20% year on year, it doesn't look like we've hit the bottom yet. So, so the, the, the effects of this slowdown, as they show up, so for example, so if rail freight growth is negative, the, the railways have done away with the busy season ch ch surcharge, which means that in segments where they compete with commercial vehicles, that is a road, a road freight, there will be a lot of pricing pressure. So if you are a financial company lending to uh, new or new CVs, you need to be a bit more cautious. So I think we haven't seen the, the, the negative effects, the, the, the snowballing effects of what happens when nominal GDP growth slows down so sharply. And till that uncertainty is over, we would like to stay cautious in the market. In which case, a two-part question. Uh, you, and again, some mention of it comes in your report as well. Hitherto, uh, we've had the sentiment staying high despite the economic growth and the earnings growth not looking strong. One, can the dichotomy between earnings growth and economy growth uh, come about in 2020, wherein earnings will might finally see a comeback of sorts, but economic growth won't. And if this happens, would the sentiment of investors and would you, as somebody who is tracking both the aspects so closely, be go be able to go out and tell people to put in fresh money to work in in such a divergent scenario? So the second part is slightly easier to answer because there is no time limit. I mean, we, at this stage, we don't know when that inflection is happening. But, but I, what, I, what we can say safely is that if destocking, and that is my hypothesis, and I do believe that a large part of the, uh, of the slowdown that we have seen is driven by economy-wide destocking. Because, you know, in a, in a situation of significant monetary tightness, 
when people are pulling back on working capital credit, etc., there is a drop in inventory levels. It is something that I don't think the CSO can catch. Uh, it doesn't show up in, in CSO, the GDP data, but I do think that this is starting to happen. Uh, this has been happening, uh, it's, it's anecdotally. When this reverses, it can actually lead to a very significant pickup in growth. So whenever this happens, there can be a two, three, four quarter restocking cycle. We are quite used to that, seeing that in say, things like steel, but this would be an economy-wide restock. And when that happens, I think growth numbers, the published growth numbers can look very strong. And, and at that time, you do not want to be in the high quality stocks. You want to be in the slightly less quality, lower quality stocks, uh, which actually at this stage are much cheaper. Uh, but that that we, that that position will change when we see the the, the signals that the things may, start, may be starting to turn. But what drives the dichotomy right now? I think see uh, globally as well, P multiples are very high. In fact, m one of the things that U.S. strategists are highlighting is that nearly all of the U.S. market performance in 2019, so far, well, it's now the year is almost over has come from just re-rating, just the PE multiple going up. The forward EPS actually hasn't changed that much. Now, if that is happening globally, it's very unlikely that uh, it won't happen in India because you know uh, equities, especially listed equities, are a, are a very open asset class. I mean, we, we, we will be exposed to what's happening globally. Within India as well, the, the, as I said, the flows have been very strong, um, and that generally keeps the, the multiples supported. Having said that, we also must acknowledge that the economy and the market are not the same thing, right? So less than a fourth, I would say less than a fifth of the market capitalization of the BSE 500 is actually linked to domestic, directly linked to domestic macros. I mean, everyone is linked to the Indian GDP. Uh, if things slow down, even, you know, uh, car sales and those we would put as penetration. You know, sometimes uh, consumption or formalization, uh, deeper penetration, marginal consumption, I mean, all of those trends support the growth for companies uh, at, at a level which is much higher than GDP growth. So even if GDP growth slows down, you know, a private bank, for example. So there are, so we classified the BSE 500 stocks into four categories, macro, global, penetration, and market share. So there are companies which are absolutely directly connected to the local GDP growth in terms of the revenue and profit exposure. There are companies which are, let's say, refining companies or metal companies or IT companies or pharma exporters. I mean, they're all exporters, uh, and, and so therefore they're driven by global factors. There are penetration and market share issues. So, like, for example, uh, you know, in telecom, uh, whether GDP goes up or down, what matters is will it be a three-player market one year down the line or a two-player market? And if it is a three-player market, then uh, how will things stabilize? And, you know, and then we have we are moved from underweight to overweight on telecom now. Uh, it has nothing to do with GDP growth slowdown. I mean, some marginal impact, but very minimal. Market share. I mean, I think the uh, private banks keep growing. As of now, they're slowing down because they're worried that the economy is slowing and therefore think there could, they could be trouble. But uh, they can very easily report 15 20% earnings growth. So I think when these factors are at play, the, the economic growth and the market can actually start to diverge. This is an issue we've been highlighting almost every year that just because the economy is slowing, don't expect the market to do badly. Uh, so there are flows related issues, there are constituent, that is the construction related issues in the sense that the construction of the BSC 500 is very different from the, that of the Indian Indian market or the Indian economy. And there are ownership, you know, so there are multi, uh, so therefore we don't think Sensex Nifty will necessarily do badly. Uh, the big decision for investors is when to start to consciously switch away from quality. And uh, at, at some point during the year, that's the title of our note, at some point during the year, we may need to change that stance. We are saying not now. Mm, a mid-year inflection in risk. Okay, what will, what will drive that? Do you think it will be a factor of some of the quality names reaching stratospheric valuations from where they are right now? Or would it be a belief that the earnings growth is finally coming back in some of the uh, well, not say not quality names, but not highly valued names. But we'll see earnings growth start coming back, and therefore the confidence in those names might start increasing. What will drive the switch back from those high quality names? More of the latter. So because, you know, one year back, if you had told me that, uh, you know, what used to trade at 40 times four years back is, is, is going to be trading at 70 times uh, today, you have to say, ah, that's not going to happen. 
but it does happen. See, these are uh, this is why uh, uh, the the p multiples so uh, p multiples expand because you know the people uh, keep getting inflows because the medium term prospects remain remain uh, decent and uh, their no earnings and therefore you know the p multiples go up for a few select few stocks. So this is normal. I don't think. We will reach a level where people say, oh my God, I can't buy it. You know, if you can buy it 70, you can buy it 80 as well. I think the true inflection will be when we start to see the, 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 the adjusting factors in the economy uh, starting to play out. You, you look at the, the external account, right? So in general, your, uh, if you have a situation where you're running a current account surplus, I mean, would you have ever dreamt of this happening? In the last three months, we have been running a current account surplus. Our economy has weakened so much that imports have fallen sharply. And we are, forget about the balance of payment surplus, which of course involves capital flows as well. But even on a pure trade of goods and services, we are running a surplus. The normal way in this we adjust is for the currency to appreciate sharply. Then imports become cheaper. People's consumption starts to go up. Exports go down because they are, of course, uh, become less competitive and then the balance of payment adjusts where the consumption levels are much higher. But from a medium term perspective, this is not the way you want the economy to adjust. I mean, you don't want to consume more and produce less and, and so on and so forth. So the RBI is sterilizing the dollars. In the, in the last, I think since the end of September, they've, they've, they've already bought more than $25 billion. The problem is that the second part of the adjustment, so when you buy the dollars and sell the rupees, that flow should add to the base money supply because that is how you bring down the cost of funds. That they're not doing. And in fact, it may not be doing it deliberately, but that's how the market is interpreting it. So, so the bond market is not allowing 10-year bond deals, the government bond deals to come down because they think that uh, all the base money injection that the RBI is doing is happening through currency market intervention, so they don't need to buy bonds. Now, this is a very perverse market situation. This is a, almost a market failure in the sense that the economy slows down, your bond deals uh, uh, go up because you're, you've gone to a current account surplus. There is a lot more of dollars for the RBI to sterilize, so therefore all the 3-4 lakh crores of base money they inject a year is being done through uh, through through uh, currency interventions, and therefore the bond traders don't want to buy government bonds. We have reached a situation where so uh, where banks whose average cost of funds is well above five percent in the overnight market are parking money at four point six four point six five percent. Now, why aren't they buying uh, ten year GSEX, which yields seven percent now? It is because there is fiscal uncertainty. So, so once we see the policymakers, and once we see these these kind of blockages in the economy, which are which are preventing the automatic stabilizers to kick in from kicking in, once we see those forces uh, starting to play out, I think that is when the economy, uh, the 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 momentum uh, expected. I mean, so the momentum may pick up six months, nine months after that, but but I think the market will start to turn. Uh, so we are still waiting for those signals. Okay, so that's the signal and not really anything else. Okay, now let me try and get your thoughts on uh, some specific pockets uh, or not really sectors, Neelkan, but you know, just your thoughts on uh, consumption. Now, the last few years we've seen uh, real wage growth stall or probably decline. I mean, uh, the, the view's up in the air, but large statistics tend to show that. I don't know if you disagree. Uh, and uh, while consumption is happening, it's now increased consumption via use of debt. My question is, do you think that this pattern continues and therefore this consumption story stays alive and kicking or at some point of time that will start to wane? Because so many companies that we speak to, especially in the global arena, while they're coming into India, they're saying that we've been waiting for the last few years for the great Indian middle class to wake up and start spending by the dozens. That doesn't seem to be happening. See, um, that again, I mean, it has, we have to look at it from in, in, from two different prisms. The first is the so-called growth in household credit is something we need to interpret a bit more carefully, right? Because in, in the definition of household in Indian macro statistics is very different from what you and I would have imagined, or or, or a general investor imagines, or uh, the way it would be defined, say, in the U.S. Uh, or any developed economy. In India. 
the GDP, I mean, all statistics have three parts, right? Mm -hmm. There is the private corporate, there is public sector, and the residual is the household. So the private corporate data comes from the MCA 21, public sector data is, of course, state and central governments, and, and then there is the residual is the household. So it includes all informal enterprises. And the fact that in the last three, four years, non-banking finance companies have developed new products like loan against property, they have started to issue a lot more of uh, credit for working capital. I think all of that non-salaried mortgages, I think all of these are things that did not exist earlier. Mm -hmm. And these need not necessarily be households you know, we get too colored by our surroundings. I mean, of course, you know, so the, the approach or to to debt of my parents was kind of different from mine, though, of course, uh, I, I would say that I'm still almost as conservative as they were. My younger cousins, I think you credit very differently. So we are colored by that. But we are a, these, these are a very small segment of the market. Much of the household, so-called household debt increase has been actually informal enterprises starting to get access to formal credit. There's nothing wrong with that, and I think there should be more of that. So I would I would disagree with this fact that a lot of the consumption has been debt fueled. Some segments, obviously, uh, but uh, at an economic level, I don't think that is a necessarily a, 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 a very big problem. But the the second part, I mean, just quickly one minute on that. That this so-called great Indian middle class is something that uh, is is. Uh, perceived differently by different companies. We've been saying for a while that, look, the moment any good or service is priced at more than 200, 250 rupees per person per month, the penetration is not going to be more than 20%. Right? So so-called, I mean, India is a very large economy, but I think the, the, the ability of the people to consume at the bottom of the pyramid is very, very little. Unless you get a ticket size of, you know, telecom really saw deep penetration even now in rural India, they are only at 55, 60% teledensity. They're at 40 rupees, 50 rupees. They have those those ticket sizes. I mean, you need to get to the Palaji uh, biscuit uh, to to that that kind of or like the shampoo sachets to really get your penetration really deep. So, uh, I mean, and I think the internet companies have kind of sorted it out. They figured it out uh, that uh, there is no one India, 1.3 billion people. I mean, they t think of. India one at 100 million, and then there's another 200, 300 million people, and the rest, um, and and most are focused on India one. So, uh, so people who came in thinking that there were 1.3 billion consumers, or say 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 400 million uh, people in the middle class who consume a lot, that will emerge. That is emerging. That is the promise of India. That doesn't exist right now. Okay, so you would reckon that the at least the listed universe will not have problem growing because uh, that one engine, which is the uh, higher consuming class, still hasn't quite reached uh, the top of its capacity and therefore that spending would continue. What about the lending side, uh, Neelkant? Uh, here, there is a bit of a fissure, if, if you allow me to use that term. Uh, the haves with the nice credit scores are still getting funding. I mean, it's happening in companies, it's happening in individuals. The have-nots aren't quite getting that. Will that still be enough for the lenders to have enough and adequate growth over the course of the next three or four years, uh, the consumer lenders, that is. We'll get to the uh, corporate lenders in a bit. So yeah, so there are two questions, and let me answer them separately. So the, the first one being that, the uh, am I saying that the the big, uh, the, the, the top of the consumption class, the top of the pyramid, will they keep consuming? See, I think this is where we need to be very conscious of the fact that GDP growth is income growth. If income growth slows down, consumption growth will slow down. And this, it is inevitable that people, I mean, and it, one, is, one of it is, of course, sentiment. And, and sentiment on current condition is at a decade low. So, so you don't, you're not really feeling happy about yourself and therefore you may not want to consume aggressively. Uh, so there'll be a certain stability in the consumption of the upper classes, uh, the, 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 the top of the pyramid. But if their income is not growing, I don't think they will grow as well. Now, coming to uh, the access to credit, see, it is absolutely normal at this stage of the economic cycle for financial firms to tighten credit conditions. I mean, you know, there will be uh, people who will say, oh, people are profiteering, that, you know, the margins are going up. 
margins are going up by you know 5 10 15 basis points if they're not going up by 150 or 100 or 50 basis points so it is perfectly normal when the economic momentum is negative and there is a significant amount of uncertainty on which financial firms will survive and there is a massive divergence in the the cost of funds for a uh, for a safe firm from an unsafe fund so 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 for example if you are uh, a, a named uh, say CV financier I mean name meaning a very famous and and you've, you've survived several decades people are comfortable lending to you but if the economy is slowing down even you don't want to grow because uh, you're worried that those loans will go bad so it is absolutely normal for uh, the credit scores threshold the threshold of credit scores above which firms want to lend to keep rising um, it is uh, we need to address that uh, otherwise the slowdown gets worse and there are ways and ways in which policymakers can choose to address that but at this stage i wouldn't think it is a structural issue that people with poor credit scores will never get loans i think as the economy revives i think there will be a hunger you know you transmit the low, low rates the 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 kind of cuts that we've seen in the repo rate and the fact that the spread between the weighted average lending rate on banks uh, from from banks uh, outstanding loans and the repo rate is now at an all-time high it is massive uh, the fact that auto loans have become more expensive year on year despite the 135 basis points of cuts these are things that we need to address through a whole host of measures once this is done interest rates are down one one and a half two percent I think you will see some risk appetite coming in in lenders as well okay now the Credit Suisse report and I think the story that we will write on this will anyways contain a lot of these um, uh, Neil Kamishra and team are overweight financials which is SBI, ICICI, ICICI Life they've mentioned out there, telecom, utilities, metals and they're overweight on pharma as well. Uh, market weight on staples and underweight on discretionary cement and industrial. So that is known and that is there in the story as well that uh, uh, that you will be reading. But Neil Kant, my, my final question due to paucity of time, I wanted to ask you this, how do you look at businesses morphing into something else I mean uh, three four five years ago we I mean in China we couldn't think of WeChat being the player that it is right now and not just uh, the, the player that it was then I think we've now started this payments model in India as well and businesses are morphing into something that they were not hitherto uh, where do you see these possibilities and therefore cases either of positive disruption or negative disruption have you given some thought to this Yes, yeah, so uh, one and a half years back, we wrote a very detailed note on what what uh, in, you know the the bigger, deeper penetration of data will do to the economy. We have uh, uh, our banks team has done some phenomenal work on uh, how the payment disruption is moving along. I think UPI is doing a billion transactions and so on and so forth. So, so I think the uh, the change is very very clear. Uh, the in the in the listed space. And see, some of most of these, the the, the really the multi-bagger opportunities would be in the unlisted space in this in this area. In the listed space, uh, in, uh, clearly some of the banks are using this as uh, as a tool, and the, and the early adopters are of course benefiting significantly um, to further uh, sort of pull away from uh, the, the government-owned banking system and uh, you know uh, and then so the NBFCs are innovating the financial firms are innovating I think that's that's the most clear beneficiary it's a very large part of the listed market as well we think that uh, there can be a reduction in the amount of inventory that the economy needs so as you would know if you uh, you know if you think about how a warehouse how do you decide how much of inventory to keep uh, it, it is dependent on what we call, uh, of course, the, the the lead time. So if you're fa if you're 15 days away from a factory, uh, you need to keep at least 15 days uh, of inventory. If you're uh, there's something called interarrival period. I mean, if the truck from the factory comes every 30 days, you're in some remote village, you need to keep at least 30 days of inventory. You know, so things like that. And the as the information efficiency improves, as people get to know their own supply chains a lot better. Uh, as the information, for example, you know, if a large consumer company, instead of sending uh, a, 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 a salesman to a store once every week, uh, instead gives an app to the retailer and say, you know, whenever you want X, Y, Z, just let us know. We'll send a truck the next day. So instead of a weekly replenishment, you are now doing daily replenishment of stores, retail stores, very small stores, and you've structured a supply chain accordingly. Some firms will benefit disproportionately from that, um, and it will also lead to 
a greater economic efficiency. I mean, India's inventory to GDP ratio is among the highest in the world uh, because of this lack of information. So I think there'll be very deep uh, structural changes on this, uh, and, uh, and and we have we have actually uh, talked about it. At this stage, though, those those structural things, uh, at least even from a market positioning perspective. Uh, have taken kind of a back seat uh, uh, sometimes for justifiable reasons. But I'm glad you're bringing it up. I mean, I think this is one of the more positive sides to the India story. Neelka Mishra, so good chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, it was a market outlook conversation, but it's always good to have your thoughts on a variety of other topics. So I just tried to do that. But thanks for your time today. Thank you, Neeraj. Pleasure being here. Yes, thanks for tuning into this leg of BQ Conversation.